daughter's party yesterday, and we were we were talking, and he told me to do a 15 minute introduction of him uh, because he was he, he says I, I don't know how we're gonna do this for for as long as that is. So, but um, I had the distinct privilege of introducing uh, our guest speaker this morning. Um, he is uh, Philippe Adebayo. I don't know if I say that last name right. I don't even try to look up it in the children's check-in area. I just go by Philippe or Renee. Um, But um, he is our guest speaker. He has actually been in this area for four years. Um, He has been a a bivocational pastor at a a local church in Union Star. And um, his family has been tending here for a year. And so we have got, Lindsay and I have gotten to know uh, Philippe and Renee, his wife. And um, we, we are privileged to hear Philippe um, speak this morning. Uh, first service really liked him. Um, he, is, he is from the Ivory Coast. And so he's got two lovely kids. And um, he, he it will deliver a uh, powerful message. And trust me, I hope you will not fall asleep uh, listening to Philippe preach. Um, and so... Um, with, it's my distinct privilege to um, bring uh, Philippe up here. Thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning. I can't hear you. Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Do you know what the Bible says? We serve a living God. We have life flowing in us. Good morning, church. It's a great privilege and honor for me to stand here this morning and bring you the word of God. And as Pastor Zach said it, you have not tasted my heavy accent. It's not Missourian. It's a French thick accent because my native language is French. And the Lord has been helping me so far to preach in English. At least to try preaching in English. So this morning, and for our time, I'm going to briefly share my testimony and then declare the word of God to you. But before we do those two things, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we humble ourselves before you this morning. With fear and trembling, I stand before these precious, redeemed people of yours to tell them what you have put in my heart, O oh Lord, for them. I pray for clarity of mind. I pray for understanding. I pray that your Holy Spirit may speak through me, and as I speak in your name, Give them ears to hear your word, hearts to embrace it, and then go out and live it for your glory. We love you, Father, for this moment in which you minister to us mightily, powerfully, by your Holy Spirit, through the words, in Jesus' name, amen. I didn't have a dramatic conversion experience. I didn't have a very remarkable conversion experience. Yet, God's call was effectual in his power and outcome to make me a new person. Why I'm saying this? Because you're sitting here this morning and you didn't have a dramatic, remarkable conversion experience, and you may say, am I a saved or not? 
You didn't have a conversion like Paul on the road to Damascus, seeing the lights, hearing the voice. And yet, I want to encourage you to know that the Spirit of God has worked in you if truly you believe in Jesus and your salvation is real. I was born and raised in a Christian home, yet I didn't know the Lord until my junior year of high school. But let me tell you, I wasn't a sweet, nice kid. I was a troublemaker, causing many pains and trouble and tears and worries to my parents. However, both parents, they didn't give up on me. They invested in me by praying and showing the word of God in my life. My father didn't know how to read in French. Yet he went to the bookstore and he bought me my first French Bible. My mother, I can remember her tears of field of prayer, praying with tears for me that the Lord may save me. And God answered the prayer one Sunday, Sunday, February 28, 1998. I heard once more the gospel of Christ. But that time, for this hearing, I was caught to my heart. And the Spirit brought me to repentance and gave me life. And since then, I live in Christ, with Christ, for Christ, to the glory of God. Since February 28, 1998, I've been living in Christ, for Christ, with Christ, to the glory of the Father. So this morning, I want to share, not my own thoughts, but I want to declare the word of God to you. I want to declare, thus says the Lord. Do you know the greatest challenge before us today as believing, Bible-believing church, as spirit-filled church, mission-minded church, the greatest challenge before us in this world today is not discerning what is right from what is wrong. The greatest challenge is discerning what is excellent. Is to discerning what is excellent over what is good. Do you know why? Because the devil, this world and the prince of this world, both, they make everything look good. Therefore, you have to discern. You have to make a discernment between what is good and what is best. What is good and what is excellent. So if you have your Bible this morning, please open them up to Paul's letters to the Philippians. Paul's letters to the Philippians. Chapter 1, verse 9 to 11. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 through 11. If you don't have your Bible, you're going to follow with us on the screen, the reading of the scripture. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness 
that come through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This Paul's prayer for the Philippians. But do you know what? It's also my prayer for you this morning. As a preacher, I don't just want to preach to you, but also to pray for you. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment so that you may discern, you may approve what is excellent. Let us break this prayer down so we may understand what Paul is asking God for the Philippians and what I'm asking, I'm pleading with God for you this morning. Paul prays for the brothers and sisters that their love may abound with more and more with knowledge and discernment. What he's saying, he said, I want an ongoing, increasing love among you, an ongoing, increasing love for God, for one another, an ongoing, increasing love, but not any kind of love, not any type of love, because Paul uses here to qualify us, to qualify that kind of love he's praying, he's pleading God for the Philippians. He says a kind of love that is with knowledge and discernment. And if you read it, the first sentence in the prayer, you may say this is what he's asking for them. Actually, that's not the end, that's not the purpose of the prayer. He's saying, I'm asking God to give you that kind of love because that love is not the end in himself, it's the mean to an end because he said, so that having that love that has intelligence, having that love that has knowledge and discernment, you may be able to discern, to approve what is excellent. The love is asking is not the end in himself. He is the means to another end. He is the means by which they're going to be able to discern, to approve what is excellent. For Paul, writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul says, and that's what God is saying too, because it's God's word, that approving what is excellent requires a different kind of love. If you want to approve what is excellent, you need a different kind, a very specific kind of love. What is that kind of love that you need to approve, to discern what is excellent? It is the kind of love that has knowledge and discernment. It is the knowledgeable and discerning love. It is not a poppy love. It is not an emotional love. It is not I love everything. It is a love that has intelligence. It is a love that can think. He's the love that can discern. He's not a It's not that I'm embracing everything. I'm accepting everything. He's the love that has understanding an insight. So let us break down those two key words, knowledge and discernment, so we may know what type of love is that love. What is knowledge and what is discernment? Because we do need that kind of love to discern and to approve what is excellent. Knowledge is the mature grasp mature understanding of the gospel. If you're taking note, 
Write this down. Mature knowledge is mature understanding graphs of the gospel. Is a mature knowledge of who God is. Is a mature knowledge of God's will, his ways. And that kind of knowledge, deep, profound, mature knowledge of God, we gain that by personal and corporate Bible studies. When we take time to dig down deeper in the word of God, searching for a mature understanding of who God is, of his will, his ways. As for discernment, it's a weird noun, weird terms, because it appears only one time in the Greek New Testament, here in Philippians 1. And discernment is that ability. That ability to do what? Is that ability to cut through. You cut through hazy, vague matters. Some things is vague. A situation is vague. A life reality is vague. So you have that spiritual ability to cut through them. To size things up. Is that ability to recognize what is the spiritual implication of anything and everything. And Paul says, that's the kind of love we need. A love that knows who God is. A love that can size things up. That can cut through hazy, vague situation of life. You don't embrace everything. You don't say, I'm giving myself to everything. You say, what, is, what are the spiritual implications of the things to whom, to which I want to give myself? What are the spiritual implications of the things I'm about to engage into it? What are the spiritual implications of the things I'm about to watch? What are the spiritual implications of what I'm about to hear? What are the spiritual implications of what I'm about to say? You use that love, discerning, knowledgeable love to engage things in life. Church. We are not called to love everything. We are not called to engage in everything. We are not called to embrace everything. We are not called to do everything, but to use a kind of love, a discerning that can see through things, like seeing through glasses, which what do other people cannot see. You can cut through. You can see the underlying implication. And you say, yes, I'm going for it, or I'm not going for it. That the kind of love, church, that helps us discerning and approving what is excellent. The love that becomes more discerning, knowledgeable of who God is. The kind of love that becomes more discerning and knowledgeable of what pleases God. It's love that knows the truth of the gospel. Not only knows that truth, but skillfully applies it. You know the truth. You have deep understanding of the gospel, but skillfully you apply it to your life. And you understand the moral and spiritual implication of any action. So let me ask you, when was the last time you exercised that kind of love? When was the last time you say, here I am, and before engaging into that things, I'm going to try to see it as God sees it. I'm going to try to understand it as God understands it. I'm going to try to understand the spiritual implication before I give myself to it. When was the last time? Or do you just have a puppy love, emotional love? I love everything. 
Everything that come my way, I'm going, I'm, I'm going for it. The Bible says, my prayer is that your love. You see, it, Paul doesn't say love for what or for whom. He says your love. Your love may abound more and more, but that love has to be an intelligent love. Approving what is excellent requires that knowledgeable and discerning love. It's when we have that discerning and knowledgeable love that we're going to be able to approve what is excellent. But that begs another question. What is what is excellent? Remember? Having the discerning love is not the end in himself. It is the mean by which you're going to approve what is excellent in life. So the question is, when you have it, when by God's grace, you plead with God to have that discerning and knowledgeable love to what end? So that you may approve what is excellent. In reading the, the Philippians 1, we have difficulty understanding what Paul means by what is excellent. Some biblical scholars, they argue simply here that it means things that differ. Others argue that it means superior things, things that really matter. But before you make your own opinion on what this phrase, what is excellent, might mean, let me tell you what Paul doesn't mean. So you may exclude that in your mind. Paul doesn't mean to choose something that is good over evil. Because he was writing to Christians. It's not a choice between good and evil. It's not a choice between good and bad. It's a choice between what is good and best. It's a choice between what is vital and non-vital. It's a choice between what is good yet temporary versus what is excellent, eternal. If the point is making here church, listen carefully. Paul is not asking the church to make a choice between good and evil, but he's asking the church to make that decisive choice to pursue what has the most value for the Christian life. Many good things come to your way every day. But Paul is saying, I want you to use that discerning love to choose what is best over those good things that come to your way. They are not bad things, but you can choose better things. That's what he's saying. They are not bad things, but you can choose greater things. And to do so, you need discerning and knowledgeable love. So you may not embrace, engage in everything, even though they are good. You are seeking, desiring, pursuing what has the most value to, for you, for your Christian life. Let me quote this for you. From Martin Lloyd, John. You may have heard about him. He was a Welsh minister. Listen to what he said here. The difficulty in life is to know what one ought to concentrate. The whole art of life, I sometimes think, is the art of knowing what to leave out, what to ignore, what to put on one side, 
how prone are we to dissipate our energies to waste our time by forgetting what is vital and giving ourselves to second and third rate issues. Profound, that God. How prone are you to give yourself, to waste your time on those good things? Don't misunderstand me. They are good. I'm not talking about evil things. The Bible doesn't talk about bad things. They are good. But you can choose better. That's what he's saying. And that's the great challenge we face today. Because everything looks good. Everything seems valuable. The world is telling you, you need it. The world is telling you, they are valuable. The world is telling you, they are good. But when you have discerning love, when you have knowledgeable love, you can cut through those hazy, vague reality of life. To know, yes, they are good, but I can spend my time, I can spend my money on better things for my life, for my work with Christ. The kind of love, church, that helps us to discern what is excellent is a discerning and knowledgeable love. And what is excellent actually is not a list of things the Bible is prescribing us to do. Actually, the Bible is giving us a life principle to follow. The Bible is saying, always pursue and desire what brings the most value and significant impact to your spiritual life and to the glory of God. That is what is excellent. He's not giving you a list of things to do when you go out from here. But you see, make that decision that I'm going to use discerning love, knowledgeable love to seek, to pursue, to desire with my whole heart what brings the most value to my life, to my journey with Christ? What will help me? I have to, those good things to do, yes. But I'm going to seek for those more precious, valuable, worthy things for my journey. I'm going to seek them. I'm going to pursue them. I'm going to love them. I'm going to desire them. That is what excellent. So to discern what is excellent is to have that discerning love and pursuing what brings the most value to your spiritual life. And do you know the result of doing that? In the prayer, in Paul's prayer, follow here. This, so that... You may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. The result is when you seek, when you search the things that bring most value to your work with Christ and to God's glory, you're going to stand blameless. You're going to stand with a sincere heart. Before God, when you're going to give an account of the stewardship of your lives, you're going to stand blameless. You're going to say, yes, Lord, have used that tools, the discerning love, the knowledgeable love to pursue, to desire, to seek for what has brought more value, has been more profitable to my journey with God. Let me ask you this question for your own thoughts. And I'm going to leave you go with them during this week to think about them. Are you committed in the use of your time to what is excellent? Now you understand the meaning of the phrase. 
I'm coming back to it. Yep. What is excellent is what brings the most value and bring a significant impact to your spiritual life and to the glory of God. So are you, church, are you, who are listening to me, are you committed in the use of your time to what brings the most value to your spiritual journey and to the glory of God? In the way you use your time from Monday to Friday, when you're facing many good things to do, are you committed using that discerning love to choose among those good things which are going to bring most value to your spiritual life? I'm quoting here Francis de Sade, a fellow French, French preacher. He says this. When I'm busy with little things, I'm not required to do greater things. When I'm busy with good things, I'm not required to do greater things. And God knows how many of you are busy doing good things all days, all week. All month. They are not bad things. We're Christian. We are not supposed to do bad things. You know that. We do good things. Why we leave out greater things? Because we don't use that discerning love. We embrace everything. We give ourselves to everything. We welcome everything in our life. The Bible says it doesn't work like that church. We have to be people who select, who use a discriminating love, not towards people, but towards things, action in life. Are you committed in the use of your time to what is greater, excellent? Watching a good movie on Netflix is good, but using those two hours to read your Bible is greater has more value to your spiritual journey. That's what the Bible is saying. We are not engaged in bad things, in evil things. But while we are busy with those little things, even though they're good, we are not required to do greater things. And that is the case for many of you sitting here. Are you going to make some change in your life? Are you going to pursue greater, excellent things? You have the definition right now on the board. Things that brings value to your life. I'm saying your spiritual journey. Are you committed in your money spending to what is excellent? Hmm? Are you committed in your money spending? What was the last time you bought a good Christian book and you read it? When was the last time? Yeah, you're buying some good things on Amazon. Thank God. But you can live at some things and buy a good book that will help you progress in your spiritual journey. You're not buying evil things on Amazon. They are good things. But you don't use discerning love to say, no, I can buy it. They are good things, but I would rather buy a book that will help me know more God and grow in my spiritual life. Are you committed in your money spending to what is excellent? Are you committed in your prayer life to what is excellent? Or are you just asking those petty, trivia, things all day, all week, all month to God? Are you praying for those things that are vital, eternal for your life or just for those temporal, material things of this life that's going to pass away? I 
are you committed, church, to seek and desire what is excellent? To do so, you need a discerning and knowledgeable love. Not a poppy love, not an emotional love, but an intelligent love who can see things as God sees them, an intelligent love who can cut through hazy and vague situations, an intelligent love that can say, yes, those things are good. I can do them with no blame, but I have chosen to do this one because they are better for my journey with Christ and to the glory of God. That is what Paul was asking, pleading God for the Philippians. And that also my prayer, my plead before God for you this morning, that the Lord may help us, that the Lord may help you to have that discerning, knowledgeable love for him. That discerning, knowledgeable love towards things around you. So that you may desire and pursue what really brings value, meaning, purpose to your life. And ultimately brings glory to God our Father. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, the greatest challenge for us is discerning what is excellent, what brings the most value, the most significant impact to our journey, our life, spiritual life, and to your glory. Oh God, we face day in and day out many good things around us. Oh, help us to use that discerning love, knowledgeable love we have in Christ to make, oh Lord, I pray with you, a wise selection, a wise choice, seeking, going after, pursuing what is excellent, oh Father. We rely on you to do it. We rely on your Holy Spirit to do it this week. Help us to be committed in our money spending, in our reading habits, in our watching habits, to be committed in the use of our time, in our prayers to what is excellent. We love you, Father. We give you praise. In Jesus' name. Let the church say, Amen.